the recording. You don't, I, a couple of you like Lucas and um, um, I don't know who that is. A couple of people's cameras are on. If you can see them on my screen, you may want to turn your camera off. I don't care if your camera's off. Um, you don't have to have it on, except during tests. Um, but I will put this untitled on YouTube again, and that way no one will know your name or your, um, no one will be able to find it publicly. So, okay. I'm going to go to this PowerPoint. Again, if you don't know, you can go to the Wiley course resource. And if anyone has a question, um, feel free to um, just turn on your mic and, and tell me. I don't know if I'll have the chat up in the way. So in chapter three, chapter three is all about vectors and how vectors work and how to add and subtract and multiply them. Um, so today it's gonna to be a lot of math. And as I said earlier, um, sometimes I understand you start listening to math and you just kind of glaze over and, and you don't learn. I'm gonna to try to tell you how to do this stuff, why it's important and how we use it. And then I'll explain the math and how the math works. But you need to know this stuff. Um, calculus three, maybe you actually do dot products and cross products. And um, so this will help you with that. Um, mostly the vector stuff that we're going to use, we use vectors all the time. Everything we do is vectors. But you'll see that it's it's kind of in the background. It's like the backbone. So when you really notice the vector analysis stuff is when we start doing work and when we start doing torque. Um, because multiplication is special in vectors. So what's a vector? And I know probably all of you know this, but there's a difference between what's called a vector and a scalar. In physics and in math, a scalar is just a number. So for instance, you weigh 110 pounds, right? That's just a number. It's a scalar. This is a scalar. You can kind of think of a scalar as just a magnitude. Why are we being so um, so pedantic about it? Well, a vector might be 10 miles per hour. A vector, miles per hour, and I should say, if this is east on a compass, right? So this vector has a magnitude of 10 miles per hour, but it also has a direction. And you might say, okay, that's good to know. Why do I care about that? Well, what happens when you're moving east at 10 miles an hour and there's a breeze blowing you two miles per hour north? How do we take those two vectors and combine them to figure out your true motion? And that's the whole point of vectors is that when we have multiple vectors affecting a particle, we need to know how to add them or multiply them in a way that tells us what the motion is going to be. Um, so why do we need them? One of the biggest things that makes vectors so helpful is any vector, and we'll see this soon. Um, I'm gonna let Kaylin in. Um, we'll see this really fast, is imagine you have a vector that's at 60 degrees and the vector has a magnitude of five. So it's at 60 degrees off the x-axis. The nice thing about a vector is you can decompose it into an x and a y component. And then, um, oh, hi, Lucas. Uh, you can take the quiz anytime you want during class time. Um, you can just log into it. It's available during class. Usually our quizzes will be available during class. Um, there's a time limit on that one of like half an hour. So are you gonna close it uh, before class is over? Uh, I think it closes at 2 30. Yeah, or, yeah, on Canvas it says it's, it closes at 2. Oh, at 2, sorry. Um, I think it'll accept it though until 2 30. I hope if the other thing, you guys, if you take a quiz and you're in the middle of it and it's been like 15 minutes and you're supposed to have half an hour 
and it closes on you, let me know and I'll, um, you can email me your answers and we'll figure it out. Um, I'm not really, really harsh on like, oh, if you need five, 10 more minutes, we'll make sure that you get your quizzes in, okay? Um, I just want to do that while we're taking notes, that's why. Yeah, you could do it right now or you could wait till later. It's really not that important. I mean, even if you know Newton's laws and you just don't feel like doing the quiz, you can just write, I don't know. Um, really it's just attendance and I didn't feel like giving you guys a math equation to do. And I do, I am curious how much you know. So if you do know and you have time, just take it. But you can just write, I don't know on the quiz and you'll get the full three points. Okay, so the reason why we need vectors, number one, is if class is all about motion. So we need to be able to, to um, find the motion of a particle when it's subjected to a force or when it's energy changes or whatever. The ability to decompose a vector into its parts, where here this vector, much like a right triangle, has an X component. Let's call this vector R. Has an X component and a Y component. We can decompose the vector into X and Y. And then all we have to do is worry about the X forces. And then all we have to do is worry about the Y forces and we can put them back later. But X, Y, and Z directions are independent of each other, usually. Um, when we're dealing with constant forces, things like that. So the reason we use vectors is number one, we are talking about motion and we need a mathematical object that allows us to deal with motion, which is what the vector does. And two, the ability to basically break the motion up into X, Y, and Z simplifies the math tremendously. And we can handle that math really easily where we may not be able to, or we may not want to do a vector that's in two dimensions or three dimensions or however many dimensions you have. So just key takeaway so far, scalars are numbers, vectors are magnitude and direction. <coughs> in two dimensions, okay, a vector will look a lot like a right triangle. So a right triangle, if you remember your simple trigonometry, right triangle has X, Y, and hypotenuse H. So X is equal to H cos of this angle. Y is equal to H sine of this angle. And these two angles are related by the fact that this is 90 degrees so these two angles have to add up to 90 degrees together. So phi is equal to 90 degrees minus theta. Um, the magnitude of the hypotenuse, remember, is square root of x squared plus y squared. Um, you can also remember this as h squared cos squared theta plus h squared sine squared theta. From there, Cos squared plus sine squared is one. So this just turns into H squared under the square root. And then finally, remember that when you have Sokotoa, sine is equal to Y over hypotenuse. Um, sorry. Cos of theta is X over hypotenuse. And tan of theta is Y over X. And then you can do arc sine or arc cosine or whatever you want um, to get the angle if you need. We're going to use that stuff, which I expect you to already know this stuff. Um, but we're going to use right angle trigonometry to decompose vectors into their components or to put them back into the full vector. So, as I said, if I give you say when we do projectile motion, I say that the initial velocity is 110 meters per second at an angle of 40 degrees. The first thing you wanna do is decompose this into its angles using right triangle 
um, trigonometry. So we know in a right triangle, this X would be the hypotenuse times cosine. So this is V naught cos of 40. And we say it's in the X hat direction. X hat is a unit thing, a unit vector. We'll talk about that in a second. We can also decompose the Y into V naught sine of 40 Y hat. And now we can worry about the motion separately. So this, for example, would be, um, I have my calculator here. What we would actually see though, because of this, is that V magnitude is equal to V in the X hat direction squared plus V in the Y hat direction squared. But here's a problem that you're gonna run into. A lot of times in your textbook, they'll just write V is equal to V of X plus V of Y. That's kind of a shorthand notation of saying, hey, break V up into its X component and its Y component, where this is V naught cos theta X hat plus V naught sine theta Y hat. Um, or if I plug those numbers in 110, times cos of 40, and hopefully I'm in the right mode. Yep, um, 110 times cos of 40 is 84.26 in the x hat, plus 110 times sine of 40, which is 70.7 .7 in the y hat. What does this mean? This means that we can just look at the X and Y motions. Oh, okay, so this, when you have this little carrot is what that's called, which you usually use for your power, that means a unit vector. And I'm gonna show you that right now. So the unit vectors are a vector along the X axis, let's say. So for the X hat, it has a magnitude of one, uh, yeah, the video will be available afterwards. Um, it has a magnitude of one and it has a direction along X. So it's, it's basically the direction um, is how you can look at it. When you see a vector written, A is written as five X hat plus three Y hat, and we'll come back to this in a second. The Y hat direction is obviously the same thing. It's in the Y direction, magnitude of one. So this vector is a vector that has an X component that's five and a Y component that's three. And so you can think of a triangle, right? This vector is a triangle with X plus Y. Now 25 plus nine is um, 34. So the square root of 34 is 5.83. And um, the angle, we could use uh, tangent arctan of opposite over adjacent. So opposite is Y over adjacent is X. And arctan of 3 fifths is 31 degrees. So this would be 31 degrees. We'll do this again. If I went fast through that, it's okay. Um, but X and Y, all these little signs are, are the directions. So they tell you what direction um, each component has. Now here's the bad thing. Um, physicists are super lazy. We're all lazy. Um, a lot of times we really should write, let's say A as A X hat plus A Y hat when we describe that vector. This is a description. This equal sign doesn't work exactly. This is more of a definition. Um, we'll get to that. You'll see that in a minute. Um, but we also write A X without the little hat. And A X means the component of A along X, okay? 
Um, vectors have components, and this is literally just a definition of how many components. A vector can have x component, y component, z component, t component even. Um, you can have as many different components as you want. How are you to describe a vector? Um, those of you who do computer science, you're probably already familiar with vectors as a column, right? Or a row with a whole bunch of entries and a matrix um, where each of those is a component of the vector, each column or a row vector. Each column in a matrix is a component. We're usually talking about X, Y, and Z. And in fact, most of the time, we're only going to have vectors that are X and Y. OK, so that's just kind of a description of the components. We're going to see how we use them in a minute. Um, imagine that um, when you round, I would round to the nearest whole degree, so like 30.1. Um, if you're doing Wiley plus calculations or lab calculations, make sure that you just keep them in the calculation, keep the number, I would use the number purely, unless it asks you for um, the degrees or the radians as an answer. I would just keep them in your calculator without rounding them at all. I rounded it because I didn't want to put three or four different, you know, significant figures on it. Um, I just rounded it to be easier. In general, what's hard is that if you look at your angle is arctan of y over x, um, I'm not really sure what the significant figures you should keep there are. Um, because you have a function acting on y and x. So if y were, say, 0 0.001 and x were 0 0.009654, I guess you would keep three significant figures for the degrees. Um, I don't know. Um, for me, when you answer questions on an exam, in general, give me a sensible answer, which means don't round too much, but don't round, but don't keep, you know, 15 digits. If your calculator gives you eight digits, round it to the nearest two or three sig figs. Um, technically, you should round according to the rules of sig figs. But as you'll see, there's a lot of weird times where theta shows up in equations where it's not always clear what number of sig figs you need. Um, we'll deal with that when we deal with that. Um, here's the really nice thing. Imagine that I have a vector A. Yeah, um, that's what I would do too. I would use the smallest number of sig figs. That's in general, like here is three. If this was 0.1, I would just use one sig fig. But sometimes the thing is, is imagine this was 0.1, let's say, and this was still this. So um, you would get some answer with a whole bunch of sig figs on your calculator. And maybe it's 45.3 degrees and it's saying, oh, well, I only have one sig fig, so I should just use four or 5.0 times 10 to the one degrees. That doesn't make any sense at all. Use 45 or 45.3 degrees, let's say there, whatever it happens to be. Okay, so this is super important. I have this vector A and it points at, let's say 30 degrees from the x-axis. And we're always measuring our angles from the x-axis, OK? What's awesome about a vector is we can pick this vector up. I can put it here as long as it's 30 degrees off the x-axis. I can imagine a parallel x-axis. And as long as I'm 30 degrees off this parallel x-axis and my magnitude is 2, this is still A. I can pick a vector up and place it wherever I want. As long as I don't change its orientation, its angle from the x or y axis, or its magnitude. Now, imagine I have a second vector, b, 
and B has got a magnitude of one and it's 20 degrees off the x-axis. So um, when I add those two, let's say that my store is here and I need to go A and then B to get to the store. How far away did I start from the store? So vector sum. I said that A had a magnitude of two and it had a um, direction of at 30 degrees and B had a magnitude of one and it was at 20 degrees. So you have to imagine, I know these degrees aren't quite right, but this is 20 degrees off an imaginary X or a parallel X, this is 30 degrees. Let me actually try and draw those a little bit closer to 20 and 30 degrees. So A has a magnitude of two, this is A and this is B, which has a magnitude of one. And here's my store. And I wanna know how far away I am from my house straight line as the crow flies. Now, when we add vectors, we do a couple of things. First of all, we always draw it. Um, we draw R from the home to the tip of B. So a vector has a tail and a tip. This is the tail, this is the tip. Whenever we do a sum of vectors, we always place them tail to tip. Okay, what that means is if I have my new thing, I draw A, tail at the origin, and then I draw B, tail at the tip of A. And then when I do R, R goes from the tail at the origin to the tip of B. So notice it starts at the origin and goes to the tip of B. Why I call this walking to the store is when you write your equation, you walk along A and then B and then along R and come back home. When you go from the tail to the tip, that is a positive. So we get positive A. We keep walking along B, we get positive B. When we walk along R, we go backwards. So that's negative. And we came back home, so we didn't go anywhere. So this means that A, sorry, A plus B is equal to R in vector notation. You'll also see that they'll write these and I don't, these little A's with the line above them for a vector. The reason I don't write that is I assume that in this class, we're going to know what's a vector and what's a scalar. In your math class, they may get really mad at you for not including the vector signs. We're assuming that these are all vectors. Um, and it will become obvious to you what is a number and what's a vector as we go. R stands for a vector sum. Yeah, it, it's kind of like a radius vector. Um, a lot of this stuff was developed to understand electromagnetism. And so they needed to know the R distance, the radial distance out to a point, and they used vector sums to find them. Um, but it really doesn't matter what you use. So of all this, you might be going, hmm, okay, so A plus B equals R. What is R then? Well, now comes the math part, the part that sucks. So A as a vector has AX plus AY. And we said that it was magnitude two at 30 degrees. So AX is a cosine of the angle from X in the X hat direction and a sine of that angle from X in the Y hat direction. B we said was a vector with a magnitude of one. These bars just mean absolute value or magnitude at 20 degrees from our parallel x-axis. So B cos of 20 x hat plus B sine of 20 y hat. Now, how do I get R? So R is going to have an x and a y. But what are Rx and Ry? 
Well, Rx is Ax plus um, Bx. And Ry is Ay plus By. So we can write A cosine where A is two and B is one. So these A's are two. So two cos 30 plus um, one cos 20. Um, and this is in the X hat direction. So R, the X component of R is the addition of the two X components of A and B. And the X or the Y component is similarly um, and I will do these in a second and give you numbers. So Rx and Ry. So two times cosine of 30 plus sine of 20. Sorry, cosine of 20 is 2.67. I'm just going to round to the third sig fig. And I don't know what the units are. Maybe they're meters. Two sine of 30 plus sine of 20, I get 1.34. So now my so now my R magnitude. So R is 2.671134 in the x hat plus 1.34 in the y hat. My magnitude is rx squared plus ry squared square rooted. So just square those. 2.67 times 2.67 plus 1.34 times 1.34. Square root of this answer is 2.99. And my angle is arctan of y over x or ry over rx, which is arctan of 1.34 over 2.67. So arctan of 1.34 divided by 2.67 gives me an angle of 26.650823, blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna call this 27 degrees. And so r has a magnitude of 2.99 at 27 degrees. Let me draw that. So a new slide. Um, I had. What was the angle again? 27. So I had A was a magnitude of two and it was at 30 degrees. And then I added B to it, which had a magnitude of one at 20 degrees. And I got the vector R which was at 27 degrees and had a magnitude of three, basically, um, 27 degrees. So my magnitude was 2.99. Essentially, it was a magnitude of three at an angle of 27 degrees. And you can see that using the components, we got the actual R vector. The most important thing to note here is when you add it's always tip to tail. I'm sorry, tail to tip. That's a better way to put it. Tail to tip addition. Um, when you walk around, right? When you go from here to here, this is positive. When you go from tip to tail, this is negative. So when we walk, remember we went A, plus B minus R equals zero because we came back where we came back to, right? Um, so just keep those things in mind when you add, you always draw them that way, but you add like components. So you just add up all the X components, you add up all the Y components and that's your X component and your Y component for your new vector that's a combination or sum of your original vectors. Now, um, 
I actually want to go back to something even more interesting. And this is a visual proof of a math concept that we're going to talk about. So imagine what was the point of doing R. So you can write this vector R as 2.67 x hat plus 1.34 y hat. That is R defined by its components. That is what R actually is. Um, much the same way that A had these values, that A was 2 cos 30 plus 2 sine 30. This is the x hat direction of A, the y hat direction. No, it wasn't just to find arctan. It was to find the magnitude. Um, we could find the magnitude by plugging them in, squaring them, summing them, and taking the root. So um, sometimes you're going to need to figure out what the magnitude of your new vector is. One example I can give you that we're going to see not in the not too distant future is we have projectile motion that starts off with some initial velocity that's at an angle to the x axis. What you normally do first is you find v naught in the x hat and v naught in the y hat by using trig. Um, I don't know if the book does use hats. Uh, let me look and see what they use. I have the book opened and like, at least on 31, they don't use it. So I, I believe in one, two, they do. Um, so I'll go to that right now really fast. I believe in, in section two, so two or three, two. Um, they start talking in three, two. I'm yep. just confused. Like as to, oh. I get everything besides what the hat means. The hat just means the direction of the component. So here we have A going to B and blah, 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 blah. So A plus B and they do all this stuff, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. So these are also called I hat, J hat, K hat. If you go on in engineering and physics, they're X1, X2, X3. You can call them whatever. I'm calling them X hat, Y hat, Z hat. You can also call them I hat, J hat, K hat. What they represent, they are one magnitude or a, they have a magnitude of one. So you can multiply something like 157 by them. They have a magnitude of one and a direction along the X axis. This is a lot of mathematical terminology that if you really get into the math and making sure all of your symbols um, are accounted for, you need them. And I will show you that. But what it breaks down to is when you have a vector A at some angle, you have an X component in the I hat or X hat direction. And you have a, a Y component in the J hat or Y hat direction. So what those little hats are on these I's and J's and on my X's and Y's is they mean that direction. Um, that's all they mean. You'll see that when we do the dot product, they do come into it. But all you need to understand is when you read that in a math book or a math paper, that just means in the direction of I or in the direction of X or in the direction of X1, whatever the hat happens to be. Does that make sense? So, yeah. So if it's Y hat, it means it's at the direction of Y. And if it's X hat, right. it means it's X direction. So notice that this vector is along some angle to a parallel x-axis. So we yeah. can describe that vector as a vector of magnitude a mm -hmm. at an angle theta from x. Or you can describe that vector as the component ax along i or x hat direction and the component along y or j hat direction, whichever you prefer. So oh. all of writing it this way does is it just tells you the components. But once you have those components, the reason why you need them is when you want to write some R vector that comes out like this mm -hmm. as a combination or sum of A and B, Rx, the X component of the R vector 
is the sum of the ax and bx components of a and b. So it, I know it's annoying. I know it's it's. That makes sense. Yeah, it, it's just a way to break a comp or a vector into x, y, and z. And because x, y, and z can be treated independently of each other, what we're going to do is imagine sliding a block, like you slide a block across a table with a force at some angle. Well, only the part of the force in the, in the direction of the table actually accelerates the object. The mm -hmm. part that goes up or down has nothing to do with the motion. So we can break the motion into X, Y, and Z. And it's usually much more simple than trying to deal with a function of X and Y, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, the other thing I did want to show you, though, is this whole walking to the store thing. Um, this walking to the store part two, I should call it. So imagine that you walk to the store and the store is exactly one block north, which I'll call A, and one block east, which I'll call B, and you arrive at this point where your store is. You decide to go home by going C and then D, right? So each of these is a vector. A points along the y-axis, B points along the x, C points in the negative y, and D points in the negative x. And we arrive at home, so we don't have a radial vector. We just we went and we went A plus B plus C plus D is equal to zero, or A has only a y hat direction and it's equal to one plus B in the x hat plus C in the y hat plus D in the x hat. Um, is zero and a in the y each of these vectors is one so this is one in the y hat plus one in the x hat minus one because see going down in the y hat minus one in the x hat because d going that way and we get zero of course one y minus one y is zero one x minus one x is zero but what's nice here is that we can actually choose any combination so instead of going A, B, C, D, we could go D, B, C, A. So D goes backwards. So we leave home and we go that way. And then we do B, which means we go back home. And then we go C, where we go down. And then we go A and we come back up. So this is C, this is A, this is B. And we still get zero. In fact, any order you want to take these vectors in, will give you zero for these four vectors. The same would be true if you had A and B going this way, A and B, and then your R vector went to here, or you went B and then A. So here, R is A plus B. Here, R is B plus A. What that tells us is that the order of operation does not matter when we are adding vectors. Um, it's the associative principle um, or the associative rule in mathematics for vectors. So you can add vectors in any order you want. It doesn't matter. That's important to know. Um, the last important thing about adding subtracting are negative vectors. And this is really important. People have a hard time with this. We're gonna go over this. A, if A is at 30 degrees and it has a magnitude of, I don't care what the magnitude of A is, negative A actually is 100 degrees off that. So negative A would be 30 degrees from here or the full angle would be 210 degrees. So negative A is in the opposite direction, 180 degrees off of A. A goes like this, negative A goes like this. When we add negative vectors, so if I wanted to do A minus B is equal to R, it's the same as adding the negative um, vector. So let's go back to our B and we'll call this prime. We said originally that A looked like this and B looked something like this and we got this R. 
So A and B and R. Now, our negative B, A, negative B goes 180 degrees. So if B was at 20 degrees, um, negative B would be at 200. So this is negative B and it's at 200 degrees, 180 plus 20, 180 off. So we need to go like this for our B vector. And now our R significantly changes our R prime. So this is negative B. And essentially when you do vector subtraction, you're adding the negative vector. Just keep that in mind that the negative sign causes the vector to flip. Other than that, it's super easy to understand. Um, I will say, since we're about to do the harder stuff, um, that things to remember is that A plus B is equal to R. Any vector A has components AX in the I hat, which is the same as saying AX in the X hat which is the same as saying, and I'm not going to, AX and the X1, blah, 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 blah. When you add, add components, which means R of X is equal to AX plus BX, et cetera. To find the magnitude of R, use A, I'm sorry, RX, Oh, Rx plus Ry squared. And to find the angle, use arctan usually, Ry over Rx. Does that make sense to everybody? And then you can visually look at how vectors add by drawing them on a piece of paper, but you almost never do that. It just, what we're going to do for the most part is take things like some initial this little O means initial velocity that's at some angle and we're gonna turn it into a V naught of X and a V naught of Y at some angle is V naught cos of the angle and V naught sine of the angle. And you'll get used to doing that really fast. Okay, we're almost never going to be adding vectors in the way that we're doing it here. You're not gonna have five vectors that you're adding together. Um, you are, but you'll already have them in components. So you'll just be adding the components. But it, like I said, it ends up in the background. It ends up underneath everything to where you don't even realize what you're doing, that you're technically adding a bunch of components together to find a vector. You'll see that, but we'll get there. So um, again, the magnitude of some vector is its x component squared plus its y component squared square root, however many components you have. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, which slide was it that you wanted? This one? So yeah, I, so here's the thing. You can use any notation you want that makes sense. I tend to use X, Y, and Z. And the reason why I don't go I, J, and K is a lot of you may not be familiar with it yet. Um, in physics, the reason why they use I, J, and K is they want to kind of get away from the thought of X, Y, and Z being the components. So one thing you really all need to learn how to do is you can set up your own components. You can decide as long as you keep X, Y, and Z in the same orientation, and I'll talk about what that means, you can place your origin wherever you want it. And you're going to need to be able to do that. You're going to need to be able to set X naught, the, the origin wherever you want to set it. It's something that's hard to get used to because you've been taught so far that there's all these rules that you have to follow, that you have to follow these specific rules. And now we have to break all those rules. The other thing I wanted to talk about, which vectors 
really nice. Notice we can pick up a vector and put it wherever we want as long as we don't change its orientation to our x and y axis. Well, who's to say we can't change the axis, right? Um, so what happens is when you're trying to do physics problems, you learn all this math and then you start using it, but you're using it in weird ways, in ways that you maybe never thought you would. The problem with physics is there's no real way to tell you the right way to solve something. This is a perfect example. You can add all the components and get R. You could draw A and B and figure out with a, a protractor what the length of R is and what the angle is. You could do all sorts of things. You're going to see with the dot product and the cross product, there is a geometric way to do it. There is a um, component way to do it. And there is a visual way to do it. And they are all useful at different times. Basically, physics, we learn the tools that we have. And then we use them when they make our job easier. So. I'm going to teach you how to do the cross product right now. I mean, the dot product. And I'm going to show you three different forms for it. When do you use which form? Depends. Whichever one's easiest to use, that's the one you use. So when we move on to the dot product, we need to remember the definition here of the magnitude of a vector and the definition of its components. What the dot product is, is you're taking two vectors and you're multiplying them. But you're multiplying them in a very special way. There are two ways to multiply, not one. There's two ways to multiply a vector. And the biggest difference between the two is what is the product of that multiplication. The scalar product or dot product is exactly that, just a number. When do we use it? We're going to use it chapter seven, work. Work is defined as force times distance. But when we say times distance, we really mean the dot product. So if we had a vector, right? Let's say we have a hockey puck on a frictionless surface and we apply a force at a 40 degree angle for a distance D of 10 meters, in order to find out how much energy, which is Newton meters or joules, in order to find out how much energy that force put into that object, we would have to dot the force vector with the distance vector. Okay. So we need to know how to dot things. Dot products are, in general, the way you've always done multiplication. So if I had a, which is a vector, let's say with a magnitude of five at 30 degrees, and B is a vector with a magnitude of two, and it's purely along the x-axis. Okay, And I want to dot these two. So my components of A are AX in the x hat plus AY. And my component of B is only B in the x hat. This is again a cos theta in the x hat plus a sine theta in the y hat, and b is just b in the x hat. So this becomes 5 cos 30, again x hat, and 5 sine 30. Sorry, that's my dog. And b is two x hat. Now what do we do? Now we dot them. A dot B is equal to AX times BX in, uh, sorry, not in that. Um, and let's put the little hats plus AY times BY. We really should put dots here, but I'm not going to. Um, if I break these down mathematically for you, what you really have is A dot B, the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B 
times x hat dot x hat. And when you dot two x hats together, you get one with no direction. Okay, so, and this part is really a b y hat dot y hat. But when you multiply two unit vectors together, you get one. So what you really get here is you get five cos 30 times two. So ax times bx plus ay five sine 30. What is by? B does not have a y component. This is zero. And therefore we get 10 times cosine of 30, which is 8.66. So A dot B ends up being five times two times cos of 30, which is 10 times cos of 30, which is 8.66. It has no direction. It is just a magnitude. But let's look at what this is. This is the magnitude of A and the magnitude of B and the cosine of the angle between A and B. So if I put A and B tail to tail, which means I put them tail to tail, there is an angle between them, which just so happens to be 30 degrees in this case. And I get A dot B is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times cosine of the angle between A and B. That cosine is super important. Um, that the angle goes between A and B, not from the X axis. Um, I could have had A and B let's say this was 10 degrees and this was 40 degrees and this is B and this is A, the angle between A and B is still 30 degrees. So you get the same dot product assuming A and B had the same magnitudes as before because the angle between them is 30 degrees. It's the angle of B minus the angle of A. Um, I got this from using components. So I broke it into components and I multiplied the components together. We're gonna to do a couple of these to make sure that you get these. Um, but before we do, I wanna talk about what is actually going on and what you're going to see in calculus three. So the scalar product or dot product A dot B, what you're really doing is and it doesn't matter whether I say A or B. Um, in fact, A dot B is equal to B dot A. And you can see that just by looking at the components, right? It doesn't matter if you multiply AX times BX or BX times AX, you're going to get the same thing. What you're really doing though here, or let's say here, right? And I'll call these primes and this is the angle between A and B primes, what you're really doing is you're multiplying the parts of A and B that are the same. So you're multiplying the component of A. A has a component AX and a component AY. You're multiplying the component of AX times B. AY is being multiplied by the component of y or uh, the y component of b but since there's no y component of b we don't have anything to multiply so what we're getting is b times ax but b times ax is b a cos of the angle between b and a so what the dot product tells you as a product is when you have two vectors that you're multiplying by each other for whatever reason it gives you the product of the components as a scale. Um, we see it as work. As I said, you see it in a couple other places. It's the most like 
the way you've always done multiplication because you just multiply the components together or add them all up and call it a number. It'll have units, typically energy for work. Um, it'll be energy. But if you multiply that again by Bx, you'll get something called a projection, which means that a dot B is kind of the shadow. Um, neither represents the product. A dot B is a scalar. It is equal to either the components multiplied together and added up, or it's equal to AB times cosine of the angle between A and B. Or this can also be written. These are equivalent. B dot A is B A cos of the angle between B and A. Yes, it's just a number. It only has units. Okay. But that's not the only way we can multiply two vectors. So hold on one second. Go. Here. The, the next part is hard. Um, if you've never done it before, it's difficult. Uh, yes. Um, we're going to go over a couple examples of all of these um, again, and then you'll have some homework on it again. Okay, so the next thing we have to talk about is something called the cross product. And this comes from what we just did was we said, if we have A and B as vectors and we wanna multiply them so that we get the product of their components, we get A dot B. I don't know why I'm writing so horrible. Um, but what, so, uh, a scalar is always just a number, maybe with units, maybe it's 10 watts, 10 pounds, whatever it is, 10 miles per hour. Um, a vector always is like five in the X hat direction. A vector will always either be listed as A with a little hat, or it'll have a unit vector attached in your book. They're usually written in bold or they have this, there's different conventions. What you need to know though, Sammy and everyone else, is that a vector is a quantity that has a direction. So um, <clears throat> one of the things we're gonna talk about when next week, when we talk about chapter two, is we're gonna talk about velocity and speed, okay? Velocity is meters per second in SI units, meters per hour, it's the change of, of position with time. However, if I say I was going 10 miles an hour, that is a velocity, but it doesn't have a direction. I didn't tell you anything. I just told you a magnitude. So saying I was going 10 miles per hour is a scalar. If I said I was going 10 miles an hour in the northbound lane of the five freeway, that has a direction. That is a velocity. So speed is a scalar and velocity is usually, usually it should be a vector with a direction. So a vector always has direction. You can tell them apart in a book because they're usually bold or they have this little funny flag thing over them or the number has a hat. It's up to whoever wrote it whoever your instructor is, how they choose to make vectors apparent. Um, I'm pretty lazy. I tend to write like, oh, well, the acceleration is uh, 12 meters per second squared. And I take it that you know that this is the acceleration in the X and that this is a vector in the X hat. You'll see as we go along in the semester that it becomes really apparent 
that we know what we're talking about. Um, okay, so the change of your position with time is your velocity. And we'll talk about that next week when we talk a little bit about derivatives. But if you told me that you were going 10 miles per hour, let's say you were riding your bicycle 10 miles per hour, that is just speed, it's a scalar. It doesn't tell me what direction you were going in. It just tells me how fast you were going. It's just a number. If you told me that you were going 10 miles per hour north or east, that is a vector. That is, I can draw an arrow. You can't draw an arrow for a scalar because it doesn't have a direction it'll point. And furthermore, it, it doesn't work that way, right? You, you can't multiply 10 rolls times, you know, two rolls and get a direction. So you always have to have a direction with a vector. It always has to point in some direction, either positive or negative. Unfortunately, negative vectors mean different things and we'll talk about that. But um, velocity, if it has direction, if someone tells you an angle or a direction or a hat, it's a vector. If it's just a number with no direction, that is a scalar. And scalars, you already know, it's just constants. They're just numbers. A scalar times a vector becomes a vector. So if I said my vector was four in the x hat direction and I want to multiply a scalar, let's say a scalar of two, then I would get two times v is two times four in the x hat direction, which is just eight in the x hat direction. Scalars are just numbers. They don't have a direction. Professor? Yes. So when we were, I understand when we were adding vectors, like that's how we got um, R, but what do you get when you multiply vectors? Like, do you still get R? No, that's the thing. The dot product gives you a scalar. You get nothing. Oh. You get energy. So when I multiply force times work, right? Yeah. I mean, sorry, force times position, uh, uh, not position, I'm so sorry. When I multiply force times a displacement, a certain distance that I applied that force, mm -hmm. I actually get kinetic energy and energy is just a scalar. So that's the big difference here is that we get with the dot product, we just get a scalar. We just get a number out of it. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of weird. So velocity of speed plus direction, a scalar plus a direction. Yeah, that's a great way to put it for home, if I pronounced it right. Um, magnitude and speed are kind of the same thing. And one of the things that really, really absolutely drives me up the wall, physicists don't tend to use speed ever, ever. Because if you're going to talk about velocity, you're going to give a direction. You're going to talk about, there's, there's really no point in talking about velocity without a direction. And yet, as humans, as normal people, we talk about speed. We talk about how fast something was going, as if it was velocity. But you have to remember that velocity is direction. The reason why you have to remember that is acceleration is also a vector. And it's the rate of change of the velocity. So you have to understand which way the velocity is going to understand how it changes. Uh, whereas speed doesn't help you do that. If you're talking about an acceleration um, of a velocity that's just a scalar, it doesn't really help you because you don't know what direction the velocity is changing. We'll talk about that next week. So, uh, sorry, really quick. Okay, go ahead. Um, so when you multiply vectors, you get a scalar, but when you add vectors, you just get a vector. So when, and I'll, I'll come back to this. Um, so when we add A plus B, we get a vector. That vector has components Rx and Ry, mm -hmm. and those components are equal to the addition of the components. Ay, 
However, when we multiply with the dot product, we're gonna also talk about the cross product in a second, we get a scalar. The reason we get a scalar is when you multiply, when you dot ax dot bx plus ay dot by, these are, remember that ax is a cos theta x hat. So this would be a cos theta times b cos theta times x hat dotted with x hat, and this is equal to one. So there's no hats anymore. When you do the dot product, all the unit vectors go away. Uh, mathematically, that's what you do. Mathematically, that's the symbolic notation. The physics understanding of it is that when you dot two vectors, you multiply the, you take the product of their components that are in the same direction and it becomes a scalar, it becomes just a number. That number has units, usually energy in what we're gonna talk about, but you use the, the dot product a lot. You actually, I'm gonna show you how to use it to get um, the law of cosines in a minute. But, okay. And maybe, maybe, you know what, I'll do that right now. Um, some sample problems in dot products, just to make sure that everyone has these down. Um, so dot product samples, sample problems. Um, if A is a vector three meters long along the x-axis, B is a vector two meters long in the y, what is A dot B? Now, we have A is three meters long and B is two meters long and it's in the y hat and this one's in the x hat. What is the angle that they're off of each other? A dot B is the magnitude of A, the magnitude of B times cosine of the angle between them. What is the angle between A and B? 90 degrees. What is cosine of 90 degrees? Zero. This is zero. That's super important. If you have two vectors and they are orthonormal to each other, they are 90 degrees off each other, they cannot be dotted. The dot product between them is zero because they have no components in common. Remember that A dot B is AX times BX plus AY times BY. But here, AY is zero and here BX is zero. We get zero. We could add A and B any way that we want. Um, A plus B would end up being AX plus BY, which would end up being R and R would be, RX would be three meters, RY would be two meters. You could add them, you cannot dot them because they don't have any components in the same direction. They don't have any unit vectors in common. Um, when you go on and study vector analysis, you'll see some rules that say like X dot x is one and x dot y is zero and x dot z is zero. That's another way of saying, um, I'm sorry, Hamid. Um, you said what does show a dot b? Yeah, I mean, it shows what? It shows energy, it shows, it shows what? what is the, the outcome of the product? It always shows the product of the components. So as long as they have components in the same direction, it gives you the product of their components in that direction. Here's the best physical example I can give you. And if you, if it doesn't make sense to you, I, I'm happy. <laughs> if you've ever had to push a car, your friend's car stalled, your parent's car stalled, and you start pushing on it, right? Instead of pushing straight horizontally, you kind of push at an angle, right? Well, when you push at that angle, the only part of your push that's helping move the car is actually along X. So if we, um, if oh, we, I know what you, yeah, I know what you mean by that. Yeah, I'll show you in a picture. So you are pushing your car and you're pushing it with a force, right? 
that's at some angle to the ground. So you have a force and you have what we call D and let's say you're pushing up at a 20 degree angle. If we take F dot D, what we do is we take F of X times D of X plus F of Y times D of Y and F of X would be whatever the magnitude of your force is times cosine of 20. F of Y would be F sine of 20. If D is along X, then D of X is just D and D of Y is zero. There's no Y component. So this term goes away and we get F times D times cosine of 20. A times B times cosine of the angle between them. In this case, we have Newtons times meters, which are joules. And what you get is just a scalar. You just get how much energy you're putting into that push. Why doesn't the Y component matter? And that's what I'm trying to show you right here. The Y component doesn't matter because there's no component of displacement along Y. There's no component of A along B. And therefore you can't dot A into B when they are 90 degrees off of each other, when they're normal to each other. That's a consequence of the fact that we use orthonormal vectors. That's why we have X, Y, and Z coordinates, X, Y, and Z dimensions, right? Um, you have to take the product of the components in X plus the product of the components in Y plus the products, the components in Z and so forth and so on. We will do this all again in chapter seven, um, but just know the formulas. Now, what if A was three meters along the X again? So this is my A and B now is negative two meters along the X. Now these two vectors are both along the X. I'm dotting them, which means I'm putting them tail to tail. So notice that their tails are at the same point. I connect them by their tails. So A dot B, I can just use A, B, cos of the angle between A and B. Now the angle between A and B is 180 degrees. Cosine of 180 degrees is negative one. So cos of 180, A is three and B is negative two. And what I get is I get negative six times negative one. This is six. A dot B is six, which means this is the magnitude of their product. Um, it's not a negative number in this case. Um, weirdly, right? Why did you put the absolute value oh, in the I'm a moron. Yes. I'm like sitting here going, wait, is that true? That's not true. I'm a moron, you guys. I'm so sorry. This is the absolute value. This is negative six. I'm like, yeah, why didn't that end up negative? Um, sorry. Thank you for catching it like right at the same time I did. So this ends up being negative one and it does end up being negative six. I'm like, how can that not be negative? Um, a dot B is negative six. It is the component of B times A along A or along B. This leads to a weird kind of contradiction if you haven't seen it, um, if you haven't thought about it. So what if I have A and B, right? Or if I have B and A, so I want A dot B and I want B dot A. Weird contradiction here. So it's not really the amount of, of um, this ends up being A times B times cosine of theta of AB. Um, and I should come up or I should talk about one other thing. This ends up being B times A times cosine of theta of AB, okay? It's the angle between them. Now, is that angle positive or negative? We're gonna talk about this in a minute when we do um, the right-hand rule. But when you have X and Y, you know that as you go around the circle counterclockwise, these are positive thetas, right? The angle changes, the angle starts at zero on the X-axis as you go around. And 
if you start at the x-axis and go clockwise, you get negative angle changes. So when we go from B to A, are we going negative? No. Um, when you do the dot product, take the positive angle between A and B. It's a weird rule, but take the angle to be positive between A and B. If it happens to be um, cosine is negative from 90 to 270, if they end up being greater than 90 degrees apart, so B is somewhere here, right, all the way to 270, then you'll get a negative um, cosine term. So the only way the dot product can be negative is if A and B are greater than 90 degrees apart, but less than 270 degrees apart. Um, just keep that in mind. The dot product's really weird. But when we start doing work, you'll see how it affects everything and how negative signs work and all that good stuff. Um, I have a couple more sample products or sample problems for the dot product. Let A be four meters long. Uh, hang on a sec. How do we know the second dot product example that it's 180 degrees? Are we allowed to assume that the due to being along the X axis, it's a straight line? Yeah, so when we come back to this one, um, A was three meters along the X axis and B was negative two. So this also gets weird in that um, really, if I took the magnitude of so basically, if I said, oh, draw me a vector that's um, two meters long in magnitude pointing west, and then draw me another vector that's three meters long in magnitude pointing east. And this happens to be A and B in that problem. And then if I want the dot product, because I know that they're both along the x-axis, then I would have A times B times cos of the angle between them. I know the angle between them is 180 degrees. Quick that, question, do you connect the tails and the heads? You always connect the tails, always. Oh, it's just the tails, not the tail to head? No, not head to head. Um, I'll go over that in a second. Um, I'm I like, I'm oh, sorry, the tail to the head, no? That is only when you add them. Um, okay, got it. I'll, hopefully I'll make that clear in a second. Um, so we have let A be four meters long, let B be a vector four, uh, where did you go, sorry. Um, I don't know what my thing's going. So four meters long at an angle negative 45 degrees. So I really should have taken that away. Um, so this is A. And you got to assume that it's along the x-axis. This is negative 45 degrees, and this is B. They are both four meters long. So the absolute value of A is four. The absolute value of B is four. And I want to know what A dot B is, and I want to know what B dot A is. A dot B is A, B, cos of negative 45. That's the A to B. Um, B dot A is A, B, cos, negative 45. Now, cosine's a little bit weird because if you don't know already, cos of negative theta is equal to cos of theta. You can prove that to yourself by looking at a graph and you know that if you have some angle that whether the, the triangle is above or below, the cosine value is the same. Um, if you've never tried to prove that to yourself, that's a visual proof that cosine of negative theta is just cosine of theta. Um, and therefore we can rewrite this as a B cos of 45 if we want, which is root two over two. This is 16 times root two over two or eight times root two. Um, I don't know why my calculator is doing so weird. 
which is like 11.3, um, but it's just a number. What is B dot A? If A dot B is 16 times root two over two, what is B dot A? 16 root two over two, it's a trick question. The angles are the same. Um, and even if you said, oh, well, when I go from B to A, I'm going positive 45, those are the same. So it never ends up mattering what direction you kind of take the angle between B and A for cosine because negative and positive angles are the same, right? Will A dot B ever be different from B dot A? Nope. They are, that's the associative rule. You can always dot in different, you can dot B dot A or you can dot A dot B and you get the same answer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, all right. So here's, I'm gonna skip this one. You can do this one on your own. I wanna do this one. The law of cosines from the dot product. Now, some of you may know this, some of you don't. A squared plus B squared minus two AB cos theta of C is C squared. That is the law of cosines. How could we possibly get that from what we've learned today so far? Well, if I draw a vector A, I'm gonna call this vector A, and if I draw a vector B and I draw them tail to tail, and I want this vector C. Now, I'm not gonna make someone do this, but follow along with me if you can. If I want to add A and B, how do I do it? I have to start at the origin and I have to walk. So I walk along A from the tail to the tip and I get A. But then C is actually backwards. So I get minus C. And B is actually, so I'm walking along A and then I'm walking along C, but C is backwards and I'm walking along B and B is backwards and I get back to zero. So I get A minus B is C. That right there, if you understand that, you understand how to add vectors, assuming these are all vectors, A, C, and B, and A, and B. If you put A and B tail to tail, like you do with the dot product and the cross product and try to add them and try to do A plus B, where do you put R, right? You don't really know where to put R. If you put R from B to A, then what you get is you get A minus R minus B is zero or A minus B is R. If you flip it around, the other way, then R would be positive and you get negative R. So you get B minus A if you did it the other way. If you understand that, and if you don't, go back and try it. Try the walking around method, where when you start, if you walk in the same direction as a vector, it's positive. If you walk in the opposite direction, it's negative. And if you've got that, then you understand exactly what's going on. So now that we've done this, let's do one last thing. We're gonna do A minus B, and I'm gonna leave these, well, I'll leave them on for a second. Yeah, I'll, I'll explain that right now. Um, so um, let me do two different ways. So when you go from the tail to the tip, I want you to count the vector as positive. And when you go from the tip to the tail, I want you to count it as negative. This is a mistake a lot of people make. We've done this where we go A and then let's say B, and then we go R. And the walking method is that we start at zero and we walk along A, tail to tip. So A is positive. Then we go along B and B is positive because again, we're going tail to tip. And then we're coming back along R backwards. So we get negative R and we came back, so we got zero. So that means that A plus B is R. As long as A, the tail of A is at the origin and the tail of B is at the tip of A and R goes from the origin to the tip of, A, of B. Now let's say you are new to physics and you make a mistake and you go, oh, I'm gonna draw A like this and I'm gonna draw um, 
B, the same B, and I'm going to try to, and I'm going to draw B here. So I'm going to put them tail to tail, and then I draw my R here. And I think that that gives me A plus B is R. It doesn't. What this gives you by the walk around method, A, we go tail to tip. R, we go backwards. B, we go backwards. And we get zero. And this gives us that A minus B is R. They're all vectors, by the way. So put your little flag things over them. Or you could go the other way as a test of yourself. If A and B are the same, but now we want R to be this way, what we get is A plus R, walking A tail to tip, tail to tip, minus B is zero. And so we get A minus B is minus R, moving that over, or B minus A is R. So this R is B minus A, this R is A minus B, and this R is A plus B. They are all different. Um, you don't, in general, want to go tail to tail if you're adding sums of vectors together, because that's not what you do. If I wanted to add H plus G is equal to something unknown, I would start wherever A starts, draw the tail of H, well, However, there could be different things. Let's say this is what H and G look like. And then I draw R from the tail of H to the tip of G. You have to put them in the right order. And I see students all the time doing that wrong. So back to deriving the law of cosines to solution. So we said that we had A and B tail to tail. And then we had C going this way. So walking A, A minus B is equal to C. I'm going to square these. Remember that they're vectors. What I mean by walking backwards is I mean going from tip to tail. You're going in the opposite direction of the arrow when you trace along it. So this becomes A dot A minus I'm sorry, plus minus B dotted with minus B. And then finally, the cross terms, which is minus 2A dot B. Okay. Professor? Yes. Um, why did you just do a uh, tail to tail if you just said you're not supposed to do that? You can do it. What I'm telling you is don't do it. Um, oh. You can. There's nothing wrong with it. The problem is, is that a lot of people, when they write A and then B and then R, this is correct to say A plus B is equal to R. What I don't want you to do is do A and B. And then you're like, oh, well, this is A plus B is R. That is not true. This mm -hmm. is not true. If you place A and B tail to tail, you need to figure out which one you're subtracting because one of them being subtracted when you draw r from the tip of b to the tip of a okay um, the correct way to do it is this way and then that equation is correct right um it's something you're just gonna have to get used to working with vectors to make sure you don't mess up um so finally in this one is c dot c so this term and I should put all my little vectors. So when I square this, A times A is A dot A. When I square this term, it's negative B times negative B. The cross terms are negative A dot B for the negative sign, but there's two of them. So I get that, and then I get C dot C. A dot A, any vector dotted with itself is simply A squared. So I get A squared, negative B, dotted with negative b is b squared. This is c squared. And this term here, remember that a dot b is a, b, cos theta of a and b. So this theta is the angle between a and b, which if you know your 
um, law of cosines, this is called angle C because it's the angle across from C. This is the law of cosines. A squared plus B squared minus two AB cosine theta C is equal to C squared. Why do you want to know that? Because it's really, really helpful if you know a side length and an angle or two side lengths, you can get everything else that you need. Um, I'm sorry, three side lengths or two side lengths and an angle. You can get the other angles or the other side lengths that you need. Um, but the dot product provides a really nice derivation of it as long as you set up A and B tail to tail and C goes from B to A. Um, it's really easy to derive it fast. We talked a little bit about this earlier uh, the other day about doing um, stuff for like the GRE, memorizing stuff. If you can memorize the dot product, which isn't too bad, and this, you'll never need to remember what the law of cosines are. Or if you can remember the law of cosines, you'll always remember the dot products. It's good to memorize. You end up using it a lot in engineering and science courses later on. Um, so now I wanna go back to cross products and So cross products. So what is a cross product? You'll see it as this, or you'll see it as R cross F sometimes. That does not mean multiplication. It means vector multiplication. Um, if you see the little circle, that's a different thing. Um, circle around the X, that's a different operator. But this is called an operator. In fact, the dot is actually an operator as well. Don't let that scare you. An operator means that you have two functions because the fact that A has different components and B has different components, you actually have two functions and one's operating on the other and all that good stuff. Um, okay, so what the heck is the cross product? Well, we know the dot product was the components Right, we multiplied the components and added them together. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply the cross components. So if A has AX and AY, right? So we have some vector A and it has a component in the Y and it has a component in the X. We're gonna multiply that with maybe some B vector that's only in the X, right? Where B is only in the X direction. Then what we're going to end up with is the product of their orthonormal components. So what we're gonna end up with here is we're gonna end up with A of X times B of Y plus A of Y times B of X since B has no Y component, we end up with a Y and BX. Why? Why would we possibly want to do that? Well, what it turns out is, imagine this. Have you ever had like a rope on a pulley and you're pulling down on it, right? So you're pulling down on a rope and it's causing the rope to rotate. And that is at some distance R from the center of the pole. So you have a rope and you're pulling down on it with a force and it makes the thing spin. Well, the component of R and the component of your force are actually orthonormal to each other. And what does it cause to happen? It causes the pulley to rotate. So cross products give us rotation and they're only the components that are 90 degrees off of each other that affect it. You can't cause a rotation by pushing something in a straight line. The only way you can cause a rotation is by pushing something at a certain distance from an axis at a 90 degree angle, or at least having a component of your push be at a 90 degree angle. We're not gonna get to that till chapters nine and 10. You don't have to worry about it for now, but you do need to know how to do the cross product. Um, orthogonal means 90. 
their their um, orthonormal. I'm sorry, normal means ninety. Um, orthogonal means all three of them are x, y, and z are in different directions. So maybe it does mean zero, but I'm not sure how you mean that, Shoda. Um, so when we want to do a cross b what we're doing and you don't need to memorize this i mean you may at some point especially if you're going to take linear algebra but you form a three by three matrix of the components of a and the components of b and the three unit vectors the determinant no, the cross product is not zero when they're all perpendicular. When they're all perpendicular, you do get a cross product. The dot product is always zero when they're perpendicular because the dot product is cosine um, of the two. So basically, if their angles are 90 degrees, the cosine becomes zero and you don't worry about it. The dot product or the cross product we're going to see actually depends on sine. Um, but we'll get there in a minute. So when we do this, doing the determinant, what you do is you cross multiply AYBC minus BYAZ, and you multiply that by that unit vector. I've done that all here. And you might look at this and go, oh my God, that's horrible. There's also a, a additional thing that when you do the determinant, every other column picks up a negative sign. I've already figured that in. How I memorize this is it's x hat times a y times b z minus b y a z. Then I just flip it. So it's b x a z minus a x b z times the y hat. It's a x b y minus b x a y times the z hat. But you might be thinking, my God, I can't remember that. I won't remember how to do that. That's fine. When we have AX and B or A and B only have X and Y two dimensional, which is almost always the case, all the Z terms go away. That means this term has a Z term, this one, this one, and this one. And all we're left with is AXBY minus AYBX in the Z hat direction. Um, what does that mean? Uh, we'll get there. Okay. But there's also a trigonomic formula. Yeah, I, I do the same thing. Um, you can put your finger over whatever unit vector you're using in this, you can put your finger over, which is why I blackened them out here. So when you get the x, the unit vector x terms, you don't worry about that column that it's in you cross multiply the terms from the other columns and so forth. But you have to remember to pick up that negative sign on the Y. And it's always top left times bottom right minus bottom right times top left. And then obviously there's a negative sign. It's just the determinant of a matrix if you know that for some reason, but don't know a cross product. So now that we know this, we also get this. Um, and here, it is very important that we do note which way we turn. And I'll show you that on the next slide. But if we're crossing A and B, and we're crossing B and A, they're very different. Um, A cross B, whatever the first vector is, um, I will in a second, whatever your first vector is, here it's A, A cross B you rotate that vector to B. This change of theta is negative, right? We already talked about that. When we go counterclockwise, I mean clockwise, it's negative. It's opposite of the way that we normally go. So this ends up being negative A, B sine of whatever the change of angle between A and B is in the Z hat direction. That'll make way more sense in one second. When I go B cross A, that means I'm rotating B to A. Here, the change of angle is positive. I get A, B sine of the angle Z. Or you could actually just put the angle in as negative. 
because negative sine of theta is equal to sine of negative theta. It's really up to you which way you want to deal with it. Most of the time, physicists just throw in the angle and then they use something called the right hand rule, which I'll get to in one second. So someone wanted me to go back to, Sammy wanted me to go back to slide 23. What was wrong with slide 23, Sammy? Or are you all good? I was just trying to write the equation because you're going kind of fast. Sorry. Yeah, it's in your book. Um, and I wouldn't recommend trying to memorize this. I would just find a place um, where it's written down and do it. When we start doing torque, most of the time, we're going to have things that are 90 degrees off. Um, if you have a bar attached to say a wall and it has a weight, so weight is a force, that weight can cause a torque, which is why a ball, a bar that you, you know, nail to a wall, the bar falls over, but R and F in that case are 90 degrees off. So we don't really almost don't need to do this. And we almost don't need to worry about this. We end up multiplying the radial vector that's 90 degrees off of the force. And we know that that's sine of 90 degrees. When we get to torque, chapters nine and 10, you'll understand that better. Um, so this is the right-hand rule. And unfortunately online, a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of different uses for the right-hand rule in physics, in electromagnetism. And you'll see people, if you look at my camera, you'll see people doing this weird thing where they're pointing their three fingers in orthonormal or perpendicular, mutually perpendicular directions. I don't want you doing that. What I want you to do is I want to take you to take your fingers, right? And I know my camera is backwards for you. So your fingers are A, and the direction that you curl them to get to B is the cross product, and then your thumb points in Z. So if you're looking at your piece of paper, so this is your paper that you're writing on right here, okay? This X and Y here. And let's say on that paper, I draw A and I draw a B, right? And I want to compute A cross B. How I would do this, and let's say A is two and B is two, and the angle between them is 50 degrees or something. I don't really care at the moment. What I could do is I can calculate A, B, sine of the angle between them, 50 degrees, in the Z hat direction. When I go from A to B, I'm turning A to B. So I know that this angle is 50 degrees. Or just knowing that the magnitude of that angle is 50 degrees, you can put your fingers, and I'm, I'm gonna try to, I don't really, sorry, I'm backwards on my camera. Um, if I take my fingers, and I know my camera is backwards, it's right to me, um, would this work? So A goes to B. Yeah, I don't wanna do that. This sucks because of the camera. Sorry, you guys. Well, we know to use the right hand, so. Yeah, so take your right hand and put it like A. So put it at a, at a angle and then curl your fingers towards B. When you curl your fingers towards B, your thumb should be pointing at you. Okay, what does that mean? In a right hand coordinate system, X and Y are 90 degrees. If you start at X, yes, it will. Esteban, um, you start at X and then Y and then Z comes out. You also learned it probably this way where X comes out of the page, Y is to the right and therefore Z is up. Those are obviously the positive axes. In a right-hand coordinate system, if you turn A to B counterclockwise, you are turning in the direction of positive Z. So the cross product is in the direction of positive Z in this A to B case. For B to A, B cross A, we would be turning from B to A. Whatever the first vector is, you're turning from that vector to A. 
So I have to put my hand upside down for my fingers of my right hand to curl to A. Try it yourself. Your fingers are along B and to rotate B to A, kind of a push. I'm sorry, you guys. I need to go check on that. So, um, why is there the first graph that Z is aimed towards us, but in the second Z going up and X and Y are flat? So you're normally used to drawing on your math homework, right? X and Y like this. Um, you tend to forget that, or if you've never done three-dimensional space, that Z comes out. But when you start doing three-dimensional, most of the time in calculus, they show you to do X out of the page, Y to the right, and Z up. What you cannot do, what you're not allowed to do ever, is Y, X, Z. And when I say this, I mean this is positive Y, this is positive X, this is positive Z. You can't do this here because this is actually a left-hand coordinate system. When you rotate from X to Y, notice your thumb would point down. So try rotating your fingers in the direction going from the X axis to the Y axis. So yeah, use whichever way you're comfortable with. Um, a lot of times though, we're going to be in two dimensions. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna be drawing, let's say a pulley that is being pulled by some force at some radius in two dimensions, right? So if I say that R and F, if I want R cross F, no, hang on a second. We're working in two dimensions. So I have R and F and I put them tail to tail because I want to cross R and F and I rotate R to F. What we say is when we rotate R to F, put your fingers in the direction of R, curl them to F. Your thumb points out. We need to call that direction something. What we call that direction is we call it the Z hat direction. It's in a weird way, we're saying that the rotation is around the Z axis, but it, it basically makes it clear to anyone which way this pulley is going to rotate or wheel or whatever this is. When you apply a force at a radius from the axis, you get rotation. So cross products are rotations. They are always in three dimensions because you always have an X and a Y and then you have a Z direction that you're rotating around or a negative Z direction. What's most important about this is when you A cross B, you rotate A to B. If that is in the counterclockwise direction, it's positive. Or when you rotate A to B, you use the right hand rule, your fingers are along A, they curl towards B. If it points toward you, that is positive. If you go B to A, your thumb would point the opposite direction, that would be negative. If you rotate B to A and you're rotating clockwise, that would be negative. So we're always gonna be in two, two dimensions. When we use this, this thing and this, A cross B is A, B sine of the angle between A and B, Z hat, that Z hat direction, yeah, you have to determine the angles when they are touching each other and it has to be the shallower angle. So if I have A and B, right? I wouldn't go all the way around. I always go the angle between them. But here's the thing. You could either just use that angle and not worry about rotating A to B and determining it, 
you can just use the right hand rule to determine whether or not you're rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. What's weird about the counterclockwise or clockwise rotation. So right now, you can all picture in your head a bicycle rolling, okay? Half of us are going to picture the wheel moving in a counterclockwise direction. The exact same direction that theta increases as you go around in calculus. And we call that type of rotation positive rotation. We say that positive rotation is around the positive z-axis, okay? But if I was standing on the other side of the bicycle, same bicycle, I would see it rotating clockwise and it would be rotating negative to me. So there has to be a consistency between all of us. Um, which way you orient your axes determines which way you orient your rotation and we'll get to all of that. Um, we're going to do problems with yo-yos and pulleys and wheels rolling down um, ramps and stuff where we're going to have to know how the rotation works. They have to be touching each other. Um, so from all of that, basically you have these rules. Addition, tip to tail, tip to tail, but the order doesn't matter. I can add A plus B, I can add B plus A. I should still get R same R. And then you just add their components. Subtraction is the same, but the vector, the negative vector is the opposite direction of what would normally be positive. So B, if B goes like this, negative B goes like this, 180 degrees in the opposite direction. But you still go tip to tail, just like addition. The dot product, which is A dot B is magnitude of A, magnitude of B, cosine of the angle between A and B, or AX, BX plus AY, BY, et cetera. And the product's always a scalar. So you just multiply either the components or you just dot the magnitudes and take the cosine of the angle between. But there's no vector, that is not a vector. And then finally, tail to tail, both of these are tail to tail. So you do A and B, A and B. Here, the product is a vector. The product is in the Z hat direction. It is um, AXBY minus BXAY. If A and B only have X and Y coordinates and it's equal to the magnitude of AB sine of the angle in the z hat direction but the z hat direction has to be determined by either right hand rule or knowing whether the angle is counterclockwise or clockwise um, we are going to do um, some examples right now of these and your homework has a couple of examples that are exactly like these examples that i'm going to do for you so let's do a few cross product examples really fast. I'm gonna let A be a vector four meters long. I'm gonna L along X and B will be four meters long at 45 degrees to X. I'm gonna find the cross product with components and I'm gonna find it using trigonometry and the right hand rule. What I mean by trigonometry is A cross B is A B sine of the angle between A and B z hat direction okay so first of all components so a is four meters long and it's along the x so a has only an ax component that component's four in the x hat direction b has a bx and a by all right so and i guess i don't need those stupid hats i'll just put the hats on it so Finding it by components, we said that A cross B was equal to AX BY minus AY BX in the Z direction. One way you can remember this without doing any of that determinant stuff, cyclical. X, Y, Z, Y, X, Z. 
So you go X, Y, Z, and then you do the opposite, right? This is just invert the components. So this would be AX if it's four meters long, this is four. BX is four times sine of, I'm sorry, yeah, sine of 45 degrees because BY is B sine of the angle and this is B cos of the angle. Minus AY is zero and BY is four cos of 45 along the z-axis. So this term goes away. I get 16 times sine of 45 in the z-hat direction. So let me make sure that that is actually positive. Now, using the cross product and the right-hand rule. So I said that my a vector was four along the x-axis. Draw a and note that it's four. And then B was four, but it was 45 degrees, right? So if I want A cross B, and I know that that will be A, B sine of the angle in the Z hat direction, I know A and B are both four. Four, four sine is the angle between A and B which is 45, sine of 45 is root two over two, four times four is 16. Z hat, to check if it's positive or negative, A rotates to B. A is the first vector, right-hand rule, A is along the x-axis, so your fingers are flat. You're gonna curl them up to B. Your thumb points toward you. So this is the positive Z direction, X and Y. Um, so we know that this is positive. That is a positive rotation of eight times root two, whatever it happens to be. Torque ends up being um, rotational energy, which means that it does have a direction, but energy, isn't energy a scalar? When we get to torque, we're gonna see that torque has a direction because you need to know if it's spinning clockwise or counterclockwise, but that that direction doesn't necessarily tell you all that much information. Um, it's weird. So anyway, so doing this, we found it by components using this. So we took A apart and made it into AX and BX or AY, but there was no AY. We took B apart, made it BX and BY plug them into this formula and we get 16 sine of 45, Z hat. Or we could do B minus A or B cross A. And notice when we do B cross A, what we would get is we would have um, actually the opposite because B cross A in the formula, this becomes BX AY minus AX BY Z hat. So in this formula, whichever one comes first is the AX. So this becomes, there is no AY. This becomes negative AX BY Z hat. And notice if you try to turn from B to A to go B cross A, you're rotating backwards. Your hand, your fingers point along B, they rotate down to A, your thumb points inward, and therefore you get Z. I have a quick question. How do we know A hat only has AX and no AY? Because when you read this and you see that it says AX is a vector four meters long along the X axis. So come on, stupid thing. Um, so we draw on an XY uh, graph. We draw A along the X axis. And we know therefore that it only has an X component because it lies exactly on the X axis. That's how we know that it has no AY. Um, any vector that lies along X, Y, or Z axis, that's the only component they have. Does that make sense, Sammy? Boom, 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 boom. Cool. 
okay, so having done all this, um, essentially, just make sure you know these rules. What makes this all hard and super confusing and super crazy is that we have three ways of doing all of these. You can do them visually. You can just draw them and look at them and kind of multiply stuff. You can do them trigonometry wise with um, AB cosine for dot, AB sine for cross, but you have to make sure that you know which direction the cross product goes in. Um, B has a um, Y because in that, it said that B was at 45 degrees. Um, and so you have to break, if this is Y hat and this is X hat, in order to do the cross product here, you have to break B up. So treat B like a right triangle where the hypotenuse is four and it's at an angle of 45 degrees and find BX the same way you'd find X on a triangle. So this is just B um, cos of whatever the angle and you can find the component BY as B sine of the angle. So four sine of 45, BX is four cosine of 45. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, Alejandro, do you have that? We're, we've got to be able to do that um, because when we start doing, so how the rest of the first unit goes into the first exam. Next week, we're going to talk about free fall. Free fall is kind of a cardinal version of one dimensional acceleration. And we're going to talk about a couple other topics, but we're going to talk about position, velocity, and acceleration. We're going to use constant acceleration, derive some equations that apply whenever you have constant acceleration in one direction. Then we're going to do projectile motion, which your book does like one section on, and that drives me crazy. But projectile motion, the really cool thing about projectile motion is when you launch something from the earth, it goes up and comes back down you only have acceleration in the y direction. So the first step you usually do is you divide the motion up into x and y. And you have to do that by breaking your velocity into x and y components, solving everything in the y direction, solving everything in the x direction, and then putting them back together as vectors. Um, and then we're going to do a bunch of what are called Newtonian equations. What that means is you're going to have a ramp with a ball rolling down or you're gonna have a surface with a puck sliding on it. And we will have a little bit of, of uniform circular motion before the first exam. But when you do that, we're going to write down the vectors of, of say you. Let's say you're being um, pushed and sliding down a hill. So you're like sliding on your butt down a hill, right? we draw this and we draw the forces of gravity and let's say you're being pushed by something so there's like a push force and so we add up all these vectors that are acting on your body these forces that are vectors acting on your body but what we really do we take them apart as components and add them together um, so this idea of adding a and b and c and d we kind of just break them into components and add the components together and solve them as components. We get some final components and you may have a total force in the Y and a total force in the X. And we can ask, well, what's the magnitude of the total force? That would be the force in the X squared plus the force in the Y squared, taking the square root and the angle. Generally, we don't care about that. In projectile motion, we do care about the final velocity so as it goes up, as it comes back down, it comes down at a different angle than maybe you launch it. So you throw a baseball, it comes down at a different angle than when you released it. You shoot a rocket, it comes down at a different angle. Um, but we're gonna go through that. And so essentially the cross product and the dot product, we're gonna put away. We're gonna put the dot product away until week six or until 
chapter seven, um, which I don't know what week that is, probably week seven, week eight. Um, the dot product doesn't come back until we're doing energy and work, and that's chapter seven. The cross product comes back once we start doing torque, because cross product, the one thing I need you to remember, uh, we're not gonna go over any more material. I'm gonna go through the homework really fast, but so hang on one second with me, Lucas. Um, and then there's gonna be nothing else new. So the assignment that I put up, um, homework assignment two, is six questions. In these six questions, um, this says a ship sails to a point due north, it goes to a point due east. So what we wanna know is add those as a vector. A vector A of 144 kilometers for me along the Y axis, a vector B 128 kilometers along the X, add them together, find R, blah, blah, blah. That's actually super easy. Um, question two gives you these two vectors and it wants you to find their components and their sum, the magnitude of that sum and the angle it makes. So you're gonna find the, the thing here. I have a warning here though. Notice that they don't give you the angles between, or they do give you the angle between A and B, right? But they don't give you the angle of B specifically. The angle to B is theta one plus theta two. So when you find the components of B, it's BX is B cosine theta one plus theta two. Um, question three, we give you a couple of different um, vectors. They want to know what the sum is. So you're going to need to add these together. I would draw them and make sure that you get the components correct. But it's always take the components, add them together, square each one, add those together, and take the square root. So not too bad. Um, question four gives you two vectors with components. It wants a cross b, a dot b, a plus b dotted with b, and the component of a along the direction of b. Um, so that's not too hard. Um, you should be able to figure all those out. Um, this asks you to find the angle between the two vectors given by this. Um, so what they're telling you here is that a dot b is ax bx plus ay by plus az bz. That's the left-hand side of this equation. The magnitude of a and b. So to find the magnitude, remember the i hat squared plus the j hat squared plus the k hat squared take the square root. So you get the magnitude, magnitude, and then cosine of the angle, and it wants you to find the angle. Um, and then six is another one of these. Here's two vectors. Do the cross product, do the dot product, do um, that. It's the exact same question from before, but it should be different, I hope. Yeah, it's different um, numbers so that you can just practice doing dot products and cross products, okay? And then next week, next Tuesday, we will have something that you'll have to do a dot product and cross product. Make sure that you remember that for the cross product, because it's sine, if you have, okay, so if you have A and B are in the same direction or opposite directions, you would get cos or sine of zero um, and sine of 180. So what I'm saying here is the difference between cross and dot, the most striking distance difference is that this is A, B, and when I write A, B, I mean their magnitude, cosine of the angle and sine of the angle times Z hat. So if A and B lie along the same axis, you can't cross them. And that's because you don't get a rotation if you're pushing something in the same direction that it's moving, right? If A and B are in the same direction, A is not gonna cause B to rotate. If they're in opposite directions, A is not gonna cause B to rotate. A dot B, when A and B are 90 degrees off each other, ends up being zero because if they have no components in common, you can't take the product of the components, right? So just go through the chapter, try to understand the math. Don't get overwhelmed by it. At the very least, 
just make sure you know the formulas for finding a cross B and a dot B by components and obviously addition of vectors. And um, trigonomics, so cosine sine, all right? Then does anybody here need my help uh, with homework from last week? I think everyone's probably good on that. Um, I think I've gotten with everybody on that. Make sure if you haven't yet that you go through your quiz. Um, if you don't know the answer, it's okay to write, I don't know, you'll get full credit. I don't want you to go run to Wikipedia and look up Newton's laws or run to your textbook. If you know them, I wanna know that you know them. If you don't know them, that's okay. So um, I know the vector stuff is a lot, a lot of math, but I needed to go over it today. And then when we go over it again, chapter seven, chapter nine, 10, hopefully you'll vaguely have it in the back of your head and remember how to do some of it. And it'll make a lot more physical sense to you. I also promise you that this is the last chapter that we're gonna do that we're not gonna do like real problems. So next week we're gonna be doing one dimensional acceleration and velocity, and you're gonna learn cool stuff, um, some pretty cool stuff that you can use in your everyday life to figure things out. Um, and yeah, I'll go over the number three of the homework. Um, so number three on your homework, uh, the original one, right? Yeah, the wild plus practice. So number three, uh, yeah, you can ask questions about the lab after we go over this with Samir, Sammy. Um, so question three, I think probably the biggest problem you're having here, let me open up a um, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So on question three, they give you this uh, information that it rotates every 1.557 blah, 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 plus or minus three milliseconds. So the uncertainty here, if you count this, this is one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So that plus or minus three is actually means that this last digit might be two, it might be eight, okay? So the uncertainty is plus or minus, plus or minus three times 10 to the minus 14 milliseconds. But if we put that in seconds, three milliseconds is three times 10 to the minus three. So this is 10 to the minus 17 seconds. It asks us for the total uncertainty. Um, how much time does it take to rotate 8 million times? The associated uncertainty, um, your numbers may be different, Samir. Um, for mine. So if I have to multiply this by, uh, oh, stop. Yeah, my, my numbers are different, but I just wanted to see on your version, like the math so that I can just plug in my numbers. Yeah, um, I don't know why my stupid thing is working. Um, times eight times 10 to the sixth uh, rotations. So here's a key point, uncertainties add. If you have an uncertainty with a ruler and you add up a bunch of rulers, measurements from the ruler, you add all the uncertainties together. So you can multiply this by the number of rotations that we want to know the total uncertainty. And this is obviously three times eight times 10 to the minus 17 times 10 to the sixth. You just add the um, exponents. So this is times 10 to the 11. Minus 17 plus six is minus 11 or 2.4 times 10 to the minus 10. Um, that's what they got here. For part B, how much time? Just multiply eight times 10 to the six times 1.5578 milliseconds. Uh, make sure that you can turn milliseconds to seconds. If I have one, uh, why do you keep doing that? 1.1 milliseconds is equal to, there are a thousand milliseconds in one second. So, um, this would be equal to 1.1 times 10 to the minus three. That was canceled. This is one times 10 to the minus three, or one times 10 to the third, but it's in the denominator, right? So just make sure that you have it converted. Um, 
Does that make sense, Samir? Yes, that makes sense now. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sammy, did you want to have a question about lab? Yeah, I have a question about the IO lab. Sure. Um, so for, uh, hold on, let me pull it up real quick. Yeah, and you can share it if you need to. I'm going to uh, stop recording, by the way.